Hi, everyone. Catherine, thank you for that. Martin, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Indulge us here for a moment. Um, where do you live? Um, I'm south of Montreal. Montreal, let's say. How long did it take you to get to Toronto? Ah, my God. Uh, I would say... If See, I'm setting you up for a great hours, conversation. Four to five hours, leave downtown, park the car downtown, take a Uber to the airport, be there an hour and a half before for security clearance, uh, an hour flight, and that. so let's say four hours. So how... And a, a thousand bucks. A thousand bucks, okay. How would high-frequency rail help you out there? Well, definitely faster, more reliable, and much more frequent. This is what it's all about. Three feature, fast, reliable, and frequent. Let's uh, talk about this project. We are, of course, uh, talking about the uh, Toronto-Quebec um, rail that is set to be implemented. Maybe you could help us out with the timing of that. But before we get into that, let's talk about the project. Give us the 101. Uh, What's the vision? The vision is to finally offer what has been implemented in European country. So a uh, new corridor of dedicated electric tracks that will commute between Quebec and Toronto, fast, frequent, reliable. So uh, the project has been launched as a concept a year and a half ago. You've heard the minister this morning being so enthusiastic because uh, the project is about to become a reality soon. soon. Uh, and then uh, we launched the development and we'll make this a reality. Listen to this. The Shinkaizen, the high-speed rail, uh, has been implemented in Japan 60 years ago this month. And the TGV in France has been implemented and in service 40 years ago. This rapid train corridor should have been built 40 years ago. So now is the time to do it. There have been instances of trying to uh, get something like this off the ground. This is being touted as a, one of Canada's biggest infrastructure projects in history. Um, what kind of obstacles are you facing right now what what is taking so long what have you learned from past projects and uh when you take a look at what you could be doing better going forward i think we've heard about this concept for for, for decades the difference now is it's a project um first we have the density of population second we have the urgent economic need to to do this um, I like to say that the country is simply not rich enough not to have a rapid train between the three capitals and the two economic metropolises. 40% of the country GDP is in that corridor. There's 700,000 college and university students who have a, a cost of living that is difficult to, to sustain because they have to pay for a second apartment or a second car because they don't have that. So last year, the government launched a request for proposal and got three bids. And uh, those three consortium filed this summer their concept on how they would develop that, con that, that project. So why am I saying this is that the corporation I lead is a crown corporation, but it's fit for purpose. Its only mandate is to develop the project. But I believe that the government alone should not be doing this. We have to associate ourselves with, with the private sector, and that's the phase that is about to be launched. So we had those, those discussions in the past, but we're becoming a reality very, very soon. Martin, you uh, mentioned Japan. Um, there are, of course, high-speed rail, high-frequency rail, which I'm going to ask you what's the difference between the two, but we have seen other countries around the world uh, implement this. Who are you looking at who's gotten it right? And uh, maybe let's just start off with what's the difference between high-frequency and high-speed? Um, our corporate name is called VIA HFR. First, we're not VIA, we're an independent crown corporation. And second, we're not an HFR. We're a rapid train business. So you would appreciate that the name is about to change for the corporation. Um, frequency was part of the initial mandate, but just being fre frequent is not enough. So if we are to do it, let's do it for the next 100 re years and for generations to come. And the next generation, I will use it, you will use it, our child will use it. If it's frequent, of course, so instead of having eight, 10 departure a day, maybe it's 30, 35. 
but it has to be reliable. We need to get out of the way of the freight train. We need our new dedicated system. And third, it has to be fast. Just being frequent is not enough. People will change, will adopt a model shift if we are fast. We are seeing numbers today, and we're not committing to, to those, but today Montreal to Toronto takes six hours. What if it was, I don't know, around three or a bit less than three hours? There's no way I would take the flight coming to Toronto. And if you live in, in Trois-Rivières or in Peterborough, and you can live there, study in, in, in Toronto, and, and, and still benefit from the economic boost of the city, but having the cost of living in Peterborough. Someone tweeted this morning about the project, said, my mother is sick. I have to come to Toronto. Well, I'm losing a full day because I'm commuting from Peterborough. It cost me a fortune. I'm losing a full day. If I had a rapid train, I would leave Peterborough, be downtown for my appointment and come back in the afternoon and be with my mom. That's what this service is all about. Let's talk about the countries uh, maybe that you've looked at their models who are doing it right. Canada, of course, uh, one of the G7 countries who does not have something like this. Who are you looking at? It's unfortunate that we're the only G7 country not to have this. One of my best example of other infrastructure is the St. Lawrence Seaway. There is no way the country would be part of the G7 if the St. Lawrence Seaway was not built 75 years ago. Well, it's the same type of infrastructure. But there's one thing that is always uh, a concern when you develop a large linear project. You think your project is unique. So you find that uniqueness bias. This has been done elsewhere. It's been done in Spain, in France, in Italy. I will be in Italy next week. I'm not even questioning myself. I stop in Rome and jump on the rapid train from Rome to Florence. So those are examples of services that, are, that have those three features. They are fast, they're frequent, and they're always reliable. Let's uh, talk about, let's get into the minutia of it. You say fast. How fast? What are the stops? Um, I think you're thinking independent tracks, not reliant on CN or CP. T take us through, break it down for us. What does it look like on the ground? Um, today, Via Rail offers a super service, but they're completely dependent on, on CN and the CP on a certain extent. Um, so they cannot have trained. So what we need is dedicated service. Uh, it's going to be fast, so it's going to be electric also. So we're talking about new corridor, basically laying uh, close to a thousand kilometers of two-way tracks and electric service. Um, the intent is to have seven stops. Um, so those seven stops are Toronto, Peterborough, Ottawa, Montreal, Laval, Trois-Rivières, and Quebec. That does not mean that all the train will stop in all the communities all the time. We'll probably have express services to go even faster. So how fast? Instead of talking kilometers per hour, I prefer to talk about journey time. Because I can say that the train would reach, I don't know, 280, 300, 250. But if we only reach that top speed for 10% of, 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 the, of the route, it doesn't make much sense. So it's really reducing journey time. So as fast as possible, as direct as possible, as less uh, stops as, as possible. That's why I'm, I'm enthusiastic about some of the other journey time that I'm, that I'm seeing. I go to Quebec City every couple of weeks. I take my car because it takes two hours and a half and in train takes three hours. What if it was to take an hour 20, an hour 30? Um, it changed the life of Canadian. This is not a private project. It's a public service that will change the life of 18 million people and how we commute for generations to come. Bertin, I heard you say that uh, this is going to involve uh, different levels of government um, several levels of um, departments, uh, different communities along the way. Let's talk about community involvement, um, not just the provinces, but indigenous community involvement. How is that a part of your assessment project? 
I've done large linear projects. Linear projects are long uh, projects. Typically, a long linear project is 200, 250 kilometers. This one is a thousand kilometers. And there's one recipe for that, is that this is all about the people. It's never about the technology. The community will appreciate and will support the services because they see the merit. So it's getting their input, their support, and involving them right from the get-go. It's the same thing for indigenous communities. The project will pass through uh, uh, through communities, probably between 30 and 40 different indigenous communities. Uh, not only we want their support, but the undertaking is so large that we need all the resources, all the workforce that there is. So we need the workforces of the indigenous communities. Third, it is so large that it's a unique an historical opportunity to get them to invest in the project itself. We have the time, we have the magnitude, and we have the philosophy of developing this with the community. So we think it's going to be a generational project, not only for users, but also for all the communities around. It's not only about the transportation, it's all the ecosystem that will benefit from that type of infrastructure. Let's uh, talk about the resources and talk about the... Um economic, um, I guess, impact and um, input from the provinces. Curious to hear what you're hearing from Ontario, from Quebec. Are they on board? Um, I, of course, I, I cannot speak on the behalf on behalf of the other governments, but um, if you follow what we're doing on some social media, you would see that uh, the enthusiasm in Queens Park is is high with the project because they see well. The Toronto Board of Trade published a report a few months ago about the cost of congestion in Toronto. It's like hundreds of billions. I can't remember the, the number, but. Um, congestion is, is huge in, in Toronto. So that type of, of services increases the productivity and elevates the concern of, of Torontonians. It's the same thing in Quebec, the same thing in Montreal. So the support of, of most of the community is very high uh, today. The, the Chamber of Commerce along the corridor have all come out last week to support directly the project. The Tourism Association, the Invest in Canada, so uh, Invest in Montreal, Invest in Toronto, Invest in, in Quebec, they all came out uh, last week saying that if we do have that type of infrastructure, we will have a way better tool to attract investment. Because if you attract a battery factory in Toronto region, but you don't have the infrastructure to have people commuting for long distance, well, you're missing one piece. So it's more than a transportation, it's an investment for the country. You talk about 1,000 kilometers of rail, and we know in the past rail projects have also attracted development along the way. So whether that includes housing or schools or um, uh, domino effect jobs, what does that look like? What, what are you potentially considering? What are you thinking of uh, when you build that 1,000 uh, kilometer rail? Um, I think the housing crisis, I think we can use crisis as, as the, right, uh, the right word in both provinces the last few years, is a clear demonstration that when you think about public infrastructure, you need to be ahead of the parade. If you're behind, you're not doing your job. That's what this project is all about. Being ahead of the parade, and offering development of two kinds, transit-oriented development in, let's say, large city. So many more doors and housing opportunity and commercial opportunity around the stations, Toronto, Quebec, Montreal, but also many, many housing opportunities in smaller communities, Trois-Rivières, Peterborough, and Quebec. So you, you allow people to stay in their community, to buy a more reasonably priced house, but still getting the access to city centers by commuting. So from a cost of living perspective, it could change the life of many, many uh, Ontarians and Quebecers. Martin, you and I had the opportunity to uh, speak before this conversation, and uh, I heard you say that this project would be taken apart in segments. Where does this project stand right now 
what does the timing look like? Uh, I've heard some numbers suggest perhaps 2030, completion mid-2030. Um, give us an update. Um, I will provide some indicative number. Let's start with how to do it. Um, I, I like to say that having a vision is great, but having a plan for execution is just way better. So a thousand kilometer cannot be one single project. We need to think about different projects. And by doing, it's, it's a network, by doing, I don't know, four or five different projects, first you do it in one project, you maximize the economic benefit of the communities, you deploy the resources, you learn, and then you go to the second project. So you apply the lessons learned and you ensure that you provide economic benefit instead of importing external resources. That's, I think, how we should be looking at this. In terms of timing, um, let's say develop development starts early 25. Going through the approval process and getting the permits in Canada takes probably five years to get the permits. So just the obtaining the permits, doing the the uh, doing the stakeholders engagement, getting uh, all the engineering done, let's say it's five to six years, hopefully shorter. And then each project could take, I don't know, six, seven years to build. It's not a promise, it's not a commitment. Um, so first project, maybe 10, 12 years would be would be reasonable. I know it's a long time. But we need to be patient on the long time, on the long duration, and we need to be very impatient on the short term. We need to respect the short term deadline to keep the long term deadline. So it's not because it takes a long time that we have a lot of time. We need to start doing in that development ASAP. But long linear project takes longer than just building a high rise uh, in the city. You and I have uh, just a few minutes left in this uh, conversation, and we had the opportunity to meet some of those uh, wonderful volunteers backstage. And Terry had a great story for you with respect to expediting this rail process. What are you hearing immediately from people? Uh, the, the enthusiasm is 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 is, is very high, and. Um, People are saying, well, we should, we, this should have been done before. How come Canada is, is behind? Um, it cost me so much to travel from one community to the others. Uh, I cannot go to that university. I heard that story. I don't have the resources to go study in one of the university because I don't have the cash to pay for that apartment. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense in, in Canada. Having a, a faster service would allow those people to commute and afford uh, that, that university. So th the time to do it is, is now. There's one phrase that I really believe in it, is that if the cost of doing this, because it's going to be significant investment, not an expense, but significant investment, if the cost will only increase and the need will only increase also, now is the time to do it. So what young people are saying to us, to our generation, well, we should have done it before. So please make it a reality. Do it as fast as possible and make it in a fashion that will re really change how people commute for generations to come. Martin, thank you kindly. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Thank you for your insight. Thank you very much.